She has been called everything from a glamour girl to a beautiful lady. She's been called an honorary steam engine by many rail buffs. She's been called the most beautiful locomotive to ever grace the rails of the North American continent. She is the Alco PA. Hello everybody, it's the Alco Diesel Guy, and today I'm going to do something a little bit different in my reviews. Usually I do one locomotive from one manufacturer and or one type of locomotive, etc. Today I'm going to review a locomotive that has made such a huge impact on the model railroad and rail buff community in general, I just can't justify reviewing one model of it, so I'm going to go over the currently available versions of the Alco PA in HO scale, or at least the ones I was able to obtain. But before we go any further, let's get into the background of this locomotive. One could certainly be forgiven, considering the Alco PA's looks, if they thought that the locomotive took years to develop by Alco and was a result of who knows how many brainchilds of this sort of style and design. In reality, the Alco PA was a rush job by a company desperately trying to get ahead of the game after World War II. During the war, the United States government seized control of all the railroads and na essentially nationalizing them for the sake of improving efficiency and to ensure everything worked like clockwork. This concept, however, terrified the railroads as the same thing was done during World War I and it nearly took the railroads down with it, as politicians ran the railroads, not actual railroad men. This whole disaster from almost happening again, Ralph Budd, Famous for turning the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy around, utilizing diesel-powered streamlined trains to both attract the, the public and reduce expenses, was appointed to the White House to run the railroads, prevent any near-death experiences, and at the same time ensure the railroads were in better shape once the war came to an end. Despite Bud's forward-thinking mentality, most railroads found themselves forced to accept steam locomotives. Even Alco, who had been cranking out diesel engines before the war, were forced by the War Productions Board to stop producing diesel locomotives and instead to focus on other products, in Alco's case, tanks. The company did produce a few switchers during this period, but very limited. Most diesel locomotives would be cranked out by the new rival, General Motors, which had recently gotten into the whole diesel locomotive building section of the market somewhere around the late 30s with its FT models. Certainly one could make a case that steam engines made more sense for the railroads at that particular time, as coal was not being rationed, unlike gasoline and diesel fuel, which were strictly being rationed for utilization in the war effort itself. The fact of the matter is the writing was already on the wall for the old steam-belching iron horse, as it had been proven, proven already in the 30s that the diesel engines were far more efficient and far less on maintenance than these steam engines were. As an example of how extreme the difference in maintenance between steam engines and diesel locomotives were before we even get to fuel consumption, you needed as many as five steam locomotives to cover one single route that you could use two diesel engines to cover, as steam engines required heavy maintenance that would take them out for extended periods of time. Just rebuilding a steam engine's boiler, for example, could take several months to a year by itself. You could literally rebuild one diesel locomotive completely in that same period of time, and with far less staff. And so, with all this in mind, it's not hard to see why the railroads would want diesel engines as soon as possible once the war had come to a close. Getting them out, though, would take time, as all the big manufacturers like GM would need time to retool their factories from war production right back over to civilian production, and in this case, for diesel locomotive production. It was with this sense of urgency that Alco decided it needed to get an engine built for these diesel locomotives, or prime mover, well, yesterday. Fairbanks Morris, another would-be locomotive manufacturer who itself was also suffering at the hand of the war board's production controls, had by this point in 1944 beaten Alco to the punch, introducing new locomotive models in 1944. It was with this sense of urgency that Alco quickly started production of what would become the 244 Prime Mover. This Prime Mover would be, like all of Alco's previous Prime Movers, produced by the Macintosh and Seymour Company. Notable, it was the first Prime Mover produced by Macintosh and Seymour since it had been acquired by Alco some time during the war. To compete and or better compete with GM, the prime mover that the company would develop had to be something good. It couldn't just be a warmed over 539 prime mover, it had to set new standards. And to that end, the prime mover delivered, producing a whopping 2,000 horsepower thanks to four cycle combustion as well as a sophisticated turbocharger. To put these specifications into perspective, the two-cycle 16-cylinder 567 prime mover that EMD was currently producing could only produce 1,600 horsepower with the aid of a roots blower. And so Alco rushed the 244 through development, cutting many corners to get it out on time, bent on getting it into production before GM could retool. The next headache the company ran into is it didn't actually have a body to put the new prime mover into. This was again due to the fact that the War Production Board had strictly banned Alco from producing diesel road locomotives during this period and only allowed certain switchers to be produced. 
So Alco needed a body and quick. And who could it turn to? Well, none other than its good partner and seeming longtime diesel locomotive production companion, General Electric. The two companies had worked previously on the RS-1 produced in the late 40s and previous models, GE providing the electronics while Alco did the prime mover and handled the locomotive body and other such logistics, including the actual production of the particular locomotives. GE at the time was producing a locomotive model for Fairbanks Morris, referred to as the Erie Built because it was built in Erie, Pennsylvania at GE's shops. Fairbanks Morris didn't have the capacity to get this locomotive out, and so it subcontracted to GE. There was, however, one very simple and annoying complication to this whole idea, and that was that GE couldn't obviously copy piece for piece Fairbanks Morris' design, especially considering that the company knew darn well that GE saw all the internal parts having produced the model for them. GE also had another issue here, and that is that because it had not produced any domestic diesel locomotives of its own design, it lacked a diesel designer in-house that could actually develop a locomotive for it to produce. Luckily, GE had its fingers in several different pies, and one of them was consumer appliances. That's right, the company literally assigned a person usually in charge of designing toasters for the company's appliances to basically redesign the Erie built into something that would look unique, different, and definitely not mistakable for an Erie built locomotive. The designer made notable changes including taking the rounded off nose and squaring it off and designing the famous grill work around the headlight. So, believe it or not, all the distinctive features of the Alco PA were nothing more than a rush job by an appliance designer. The end result of the work of this stylist, despite him having no experience whatsoever in designing domestic locomotives, was stunning. It set new standards in beauty when their engine was released. It blew the doors off the competition in terms of how it looked and its specifications. The six axles gave this locomotive a very comfortable ride for the crew, and the GE traction motors gave the engine incredible traction, especially at low speeds on the mountains, something that would normally cook the traction motors of an EMD product from the time. Also, its, its 244 16-cylinder engine cranked out 2,000 horsepower. This was thanks to its turbocharger and its four cycle setup. All EMD could offer at the time was a 16-cylinder that made 1,600 horsepower, as this was a two-cycle setup relying on a roots blower. Now one might think, especially with these specifications by this point, that the Alco PA was a huge success and sold several millions happily ever after. Well, no. You see, the 244 was, as I mentioned before, a rush job. Now it's not entirely uncommon for a prime mover to have weaknesses in it, but unfortunately in the case of the PA, it never went the pro underwent the proper testing to discover these weaknesses before they were delivered to the railroads that ordered them. The end result, the railroad companies wound up being the unwitting testers of this locomotive, and it uncovered some flaws, including mainly the crankshaft, which is a rod or cylindrical-like device that runs through the middle of the engine, transferring the up-and-down motion of the pistons to a rotational motion, which once connected through a flywheel, which turned the main generator, which in turn powered the traction motors, which in turn made the locomotive move. After several more documented failures and a detailed investigation were done, it was found the saddle bearings which hold the shaft in place were to blame. They were out of round, causing the shaft to break in two and fail. Now we have to remember that the crankshaft is located in the base of the lo locomotive's motor itself. To get at this, the locomotive literally has to be disassembled. Now in the case of a car, you literally have to pull the engine out, out, out from underneath the hood. Probably not worth it unless you're under warranty. If you are, you're out of commission for two weeks. And hopefully you'll get a loaner in that time. In the case of a railroad, especially if you were dealing with Alco, which did not have deep pockets and did not have things like loaners, you would not be out of commission for just two weeks, you would be out of commission for up to a few months to even a year, depending upon how sophisticated the job was, once, what specific model, etc. If you're a railroad and you've just dumped a whole load of money on a brand new locomotive, which is when these started to fail in their early life, and now it's broken, and you now, on top of everything else, while you will get the repair done for free, you still need to provide a locomotive to temporarily replace it at least, which can get very expensive. Needless to say, if you're a busy railroad that just had to go through this, you're going to remember any kind of failure like this, especially if it wasn't just limited to your Alco PAs. It would be if it is occurring on the RS3, the FAs, anything that basically had the 244 in it. Luckily, the majority of the smaller switch engines, such as the S-series switchers, still were using the old 539 turbocharged prime mover. The model for this never did make the transition in. Essentially, the 244 annihilated Alco's reputation, and it never got it back. The end result was roughly 297 Alco PAs, less than 300 were actually built. While there were less than 300 Alco PAs built as new, there was the story of the 4X Santa Fe Alco PAs that were rebuilt for the Delaware and Hudson. 
They were initially acquired in the late 60s by the DNH to replace RS-2s on their passenger runs, the two the, two the company ran and operated. By the early to mid-1970s, they were sent to Morrison Knudsen to be rebuilt with a 251 12-cylinder prime mover, known as the 251F, that created actually 400 horsepower more than the 16-cylinder it replaced. The engines would serve with Amtrak until the turbo trains were introduced, then be leased out to MBTA before finally being sold over to the Pacifico Railroad in Mexico. The beautiful Lake Champlain blue, silver, and gold striping paint scheme with its gold badging is probably the most known paint scheme and most beautiful paint scheme these engines were ever placed in. They wore this paint scheme both before and after rebuilding to the 251F style prime movers, which drastically improved their reliability and performance as well as efficiency. During their time on the Pacifico Railroad, all of these engines were wrecked and or fa suffered massive mechanical failures. Two of them were eventually rebuilt in Mexico, while the remaining two were returned to the United States. One is currently owned by Doyle McCormick, being restored to full operation, while the other is owned by the Museum of the American Railroad, being restored to its original Santa Fe paint and now full operation, as recently announced. Now let's take a look at some of the models. We'll start with Atherin, and as we see by the picture of the Dash Series GE locomotive on the front, this particular model is one of the lighter production locomotives produced sometime in the late 90s or early to late 2000s, just before 2010. As you can see, this particular model is pristine. In its original box with all the original Bowman padding, I acquired this at a uh, train show a couple of years back. It's got the detail parts. It has never been touched or even taken out of its box. So I'm committing a bit of a sin here, at least as far as I know. I think I may have taken out at the show, if I'm honest. Again, the portholes and the couplers are not in place. The little porthole windows, I should say, are not in place. Or the couplers, the coupler boxes, etc. This thing is as it would have been if you were to walk into a hobby shop around that period of time and bought it off the shelf. These engines are really easy to work on. They have a very simplistic mecha mechanical setup inside. As illustrated here by this particular locomotive, which underwent a basic conversion to DCC. As you can see, it's a simple JTS plug, wired in uh, with the motor isolated. For more information on this, or if you're interested, go take a look at my video on the Penn Alco PA restoration I did. It's also on my YouTube channel. And over here, we'll switch to another image of this. Again, the same traditional layout that would basically become, as we call, a classic in this particular hobby. The motor is mounted center point, a flywheel on either side. It has a gearbox on either side that drives each of the trucks. The trucks are six axles. In this case, they've been upgraded to nickel silver wheels. Parts for this engine are very easy to come by, and just to prove it, Here's another one of my projects where I took another Alco PA and did major upgrades to it. As you can see, this is a D&H engine. I painted the trucks on this engine. That's part of the footage. Unfortunately, got lost um, more recently when I did a computer move and revamped my YouTube channel. Here's a shot of the frame and exactly what I did. I essentially, I mounted a modern Atherin Genesis motor to this one to get it to run smoother, as you can see there. Just using standard Atherin mount screws that went right in. I also put a Loke Sounds DCC and sound decoder in there. This locomotive really runs smooth, and um, it really blew me away with how well it came out. I was not expecting this to be that to be that much of an achievement when I saw it. I even got a Mars light and a standard headlight in it. And just to show you, I'm not kidding on that. Here's a shot of one of two of these locomotives hey, running on my layout. Up. There she is. This is actually number 19. This one gave me a particularly big challenge. This is the sister to 18. 18 runs two. I have her sitting right here right now. I think and as you can see, and as I made pretty well clear, this, all the work was definitely worth it on this model. It runs beautifully. It's one of my favorite ones to run right now. And I have this wonderful feeling of accomplishment for getting it done. But anyway, this is definitely a good recommendation if you're looking to get into it. Again, examples of this locomotive can run as little as $5 online. My advice would be to go for the newer frame, although you can still work with the old frame if you'd like. Take a look at my video on the different Alco PA frames for more information on that. And while, yeah, the detailing may not be up to snuff compared to the more expensive models, we have to remember this was a mass-produced model. Atherin was trying to make these two a price and did a very good job on what he accomplished. Those motors are easy to maintain. The detailing is decent on it. It really does the job for the price very well. This is also a great locomotive for a first-time kit bashing project, as there are several companies that provide for this engine in terms of motors, shafts, etc. You can also fit a lot of other parts from other companies' locomotives to fit this one, because a lot of engines were based upon its design. We use them instead of the C420, but the main reason why it's in there is, and a lot of people think that's inaccurate for this, and actually it is. The next model on my list is the Proto 2000 Alco PA. You may have recognized this, this particular locomotive from an earlier video I did on the Proto 2000 line from Lifelike. This is again 
so the next attempt since the, as far as I know from the Atherin, to make a ready-to-run locomotive version of this, uh, Lifelike, of course, took it to the next level. As nice as the Atherins were, especially for their price point, this engine pretty much turns it up a notch. It's kind of like going from color TV or black and white TV to HD, if you will, in terms of the graphics updates. I think actually more like color to black and white, uh, black and white to color, I should say. As you can see, the box is fully detailed. Gives you all the info on the drive system, typical, typical Lifelike. You're reminded very quickly that you have a high-quality product. Again, the company's slogan with this model and most other Proto 2000 models was, we build them like they used to. Now let's take a look at this locomotive up close and personal and, well, outside of the box. As we can see by the detailing on it, especially that earlier Alco PA that we just looked at a little bit a little while before this from the Atherin line, there are noticeable differences in the detailing, including those nice little fuel ports on the side of the locomotive that are actually separately applied and not simply molded into the plastic like on the Atherin. We also see the little silver trimmers on the top, as well as the grill right behind the cab. Cab, That's all painted silver where it's just blue on the Atherin. Again, the Atherin was trying to sort of keep the budget down. The detailing here was more priority on the Proto 2000 line. We also see the horns are improperly painted and are in the proper locations. And again, if we do a nose-to-nose -nose comparison, we can see that the paint is definitely a little bit more vibrant on the Proto 2000, which is on the right, and, that, and as opposed to the Atherin on the left. Again, the Atherin was kind of mass-produced. All the detail parts were the same on all of those engines, regardless of what road name paint scheme you got. Again, this is mass-produced, whereas, whereas the Proto 2000s tried to make them more road-specific. There were even little detail bags that came with this engine to specifically detail the locomotive to the time frame you wanted it to be, and or if it was a special road detail, it was included in the box. A lot of nice touches to really show that the locomotive was a modern one, unlike the Atherin models, which are starting to get on in age at that point. Now, as we look at the nose, we see that the lines are noticeably sharper on the new locomotive, the Proto 2000 on the right, as opposed to the Atherin on the left. The Proto 2000 definitely has a lot more color definition, and, and the contrast, the blue is definitely a darker color, a darker shade of it, much more vibrant. The nose is painted yellow, which it should have been. The other Alco doesn't have that, the one from the Atherin on the left. Again, that was a mass-produced engine, whereas the Proto 2000 was, was more of a custom order engine from a later generation. You can clearly see how much trains kind of change between the two eras. Again, we're talking talking about 30 years between the two of these things being produced, 20 years actually, more likely. Pretty impressive, though, to see what Proto 2000 was able to put into this model. Another nice little touch is to the front pilot hole on the Proto 2000 on the right. You could, there actually is a plug that comes with a kit that you can block this off on, something I'm tempted to do with my own unit, as we'll see it running in a little bit. I still don't have it done yet on it. It's still doing work on this engine, to be honest. Uh, not, again, sharper lines in general, just overall a much nicer engine. And again, we see the silver trim right above the windows, something you didn't get on the Atherin. The operations of this locomotive are very smooth and very quiet. Please note that the decoder I installed didn't quite go in smoothly. As you'll note, it's not quite level if you look closely. I made it around my track, and I even ran up my mountain, and surprisingly had no derailments. This has been an issue for the Algo PAs. Then again, with all my recent upgrades to 22-inch tracks and a lot of track rebuilding programs, it seems to have all paid off, to a certain extent at least. Also note that there's a little bit more color on my layout. I'll be doing a video on that later on to explain just what I've been doing with this layout in this strange time we've been living in. Also note that this locomotive does come from the factory with a factory Mars light. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get it functioning with the Jerry Rig decoder, and the sound decoder I installed later on didn't actually work at all. I've since received a new type sound decoder to install in this locomotive. I'm just waiting to get to it as it's not on the high level of my priority list as I have other projects I have to get done first before that one will get attention from me.
And here's a quick shot of the internals of this locomotive. As you can see, the locomotive's motor is buried underneath that massive metal weight, and the circuit board for the DCC readiness is corralled at the back of the unit. Kind of awkward to work with to the, today. It shares very little with the Atherman design other than having flywheels. It has a more modern Mabashi style motor, I believe they're referred to as, mounted in a saddle arrangement with screws at the base to mount it in place, covered by the fuel tank mounted below the uh, body itself. As is typical with most modern model locomotives, the Mabashi motor utilizes drive shafts and five poles to produce a very smooth running model in general. Worm gears again link the, tr link the shafts down to the trucks, and this thing overall runs whisper quiet. It's just, you can't compare the Atherin with this locomotive. It is just such a huge upgrade. Proto one, the Proto 2000 and Life Light did a great job of making this thing work the way it was supposed to. So to sum up this particular model, it's typical Proto 2000, very nicely detailed, very well built, with the exception of the infamous grease issues and occasional gear cracking, although that doesn't happen very much on this variation. It's a very smooth runner and very reliable. Now all that said, there are some quirks with it. To start with, it's an older design. The decoders back in the day when this model was released in the mid-90s really weren't that popular. The DCC was almost a gimmick by itself, the plug availability. You could put a plug in this one, but it's an, ultra, it's an awkward install as you saw by my test run with it. There is a decoder board made by MRC that drops in place, but that limits you. And again, the quality of those decoders is questionable. And so my final verdict, if you see one of these on sale or at a train show for a good price, it might be something you might want to grab. Just be forewarned, you're going to be limited in options for DCC decoders, and prices will be all over the place, and there will not be any factory support. And now let's move on to our next model of the Alco PA, and it is, of course, the Walters Mainline. I kept my enthusiasm in check, shall we say. As Walters, if you haven't seen my other video on the Proto 1000, 2000, and Lifelike series in general, bought Lifelike a number of years back. I expected this essentially to be, therefore, a simple knockoff of that tooling, with the exception of some very minor upgrades and nothing more. I was actually pleasantly surprised. Let's take a good look at her and get her out of the box. Again, a note on this locomotive is that it is, in fact, a New York Central model, one of my favorite railroads to model, and because it was right around the area I, uh, out of the area I live around, uh, Hudson River ex line, etc., water level route, it is in fact a DCC. This is in fact the DCC and sound equipped variation of this locomotive, and it is the later variation of this locomotive with a with the Loke Sound ESU 4.0 decoder instead of the Econami decoder as previous models had. There are a lot of advantages to this. To start with, the Econami was not a full function sound decoder, lacking the startup, shutdown sequences, coupler clank, radio chatter, etc. The Loke Sound has that, those, and unlike this Econami, which was basically a 244 12-cylinder engine, the incorrect size for this locomotive, the ESU Lok Sound decoder actually has the 244 16-cylinder, which is what the Alco PAs had. This might seem like a minor detail, but it really gives the locomotive a more realistic sound to it. Anyway, let's get her out of the box and take a good look at her. Again, this is a mainline locomotive, not the hardcore proto line. Again, mainline is the entry-level sort of more, more economic-focused type locomotive line that Walters markets. Upon close inspection, we see there are some details missing. For example, in the front plow there, there are supposed to be two lower grab irons for the crew to hang on to. Those are gone. There are also, on the rear, there are supposed to be two ladder assemblies that actually are, actually are applied separately to the back. Those aren't there either. And again, on the rear of the locomotive, there are also two lower grab irons, yet again, for the crew to hang on to while doing switching, shunting, etc. Those are missing as well. No, no thread, if you do want those details, you can get a detail kit for a few dollars from Walters. As we've just seen in that particular photo, you, uh, that particular frame you just saw, the locomotive's horns are in fact a little bit out of place and were somewhat broken in transit. They're still attached, but just not very well. I was able to fix this very simply. I simply used some plastic zap, one of my favorite glue th things, applied a little of that on there, and it went ahead and, went ahead and s suited it down really nice onto the plastic, and it held it, and it fixed the problem right up. You'd never get good as new, you'd never guess it was done. Although there was, I did have a little glue over spray. I seem to always have problems with putting horns on. Don't ask me why, it's one of the things I struggle with. Other than that, the locomotive has the same usual detailing the Proto 2000 line had when it was in production. As you see, it has that fan in the rear of the locomotive, motive which you can see through the top. The smokestack is in place, and there are a few other little details on the top there. There are, again, a few extra hooks that are supposed to be on the rear of that rear hatch over there, as we see that they're missing. Again, these come as part of the detailing kit, which Walters wants a few bucks for. And again, I'm probably not going to even touch that, as I just don't have the patience for doing little detail work. I see me there just doing a little work on getting the horns glued back into position correctly. Now let's take a look at her from the side. As we can see again, the minor grab irons are again are kind of prevalently not in place. The ladder railings on the side for the center entrance arm. There are a lot of nice little details, including the 
little red fueling mark right on the side there where the fuel is supposed to go. There's a small builder's plate underneath the number right there as we see. It's for the most part, at least in terms of the shell, a reissue with the Proto 2000 model, but with just a few lacking details. We also note the rear functioning diaphragm. Again, this is essentially the same as it was on the Proto 2000 line, minus the opening door, which does not open in this case. And if we take a look at the nose, pretty much again as the Proto 2000 line had it, with a single headlight, as this is actually correct, as the New York Central PAs did not have Mars lights, they just had a single headlight in place on the top. The nose itself is unchanged in the previous, pr previous Proto 2000 model, which may upset some modelers, as I've heard a lot of complaints that even Proto 2000 had failed to get the dimensions quite right for the long snout of these engines. Well, let's say we give this thing a test run. Again, we note the very distinctive clatter that the 16-cylinder variation of the 244 has on startup. Again, the startup feature itself was not available on the on the Tsunami Economy decoder, as it, doesn't, it didn't have it, and at the same time it used the 12-cylinder prime mover, which was not correct for this particular engine. Right out of the box, I was very happy with the slow crawl this locomotive was capable of, as it gently eased these old-school heavyweight-style coaches, which were in this case from Lionel, out onto my main line. They might, I also must admit, they match this paint scheme very nicely as the lightning strike matches up very well with the Alco PAs, despite the fact that these coaches weren't run much by the PAs as they were at the end of their lifespan by the point that this locomotive was introduced. The sound, as we can also hear, is very loud and clear on these locomotives, and the unique 244 16 cylinder really shines through because of this. No baffle, vibrations, nothing, just pure sound. Very good job there on ESU or whoever designed the sound system, although I believe ESU actually did baffle work on this particular engine for the workers. One thing I forgot to mention earlier is that this locomotive has quite a bit of weight to it, even more than I dare say the Proto 2000 variant had, even though the internals are somewhat similar. We'll get more into that later on. As you can see, the locomotive had no trouble negotiating the tight, twisty turns of the center track, which, were, which includes some 18-inch turns right back there, before the, right after the S-curve. It's always been there. As enjoyable as it is to watch this engine go round and round, let's try something different. Let's give this engine the ultimate acid test. Let's try this locomotive on my mountain run and see if it can stay on the track. I should note that this part of Leonard has had a lot of updates in more recent times, including the rails being upgraded on that initial ascent to 22 inch turns, and the initial ascent being modified in terms of its height and in terms of the placing of the supports over there on that ascent of where the ascent starts. And as we see, the train made it to Whitestone Mountain Station without any derailments, problems, etc. at all. Couldn't have asked for a better result. All aboard!
if you haven't noticed already, I was very impressed with this locomotive's operation. It was so smooth you could barely hear the motor run at all. Anyway, let's bring this run to an end and get the passengers safely back to Seacliff Station. But first, let's watch a little switching in Midville Yard by an RS-36. With the passengers detrained, let's drop the coaches in the main, on the main line and give this engine a shot at switching. Well, I don't think I'm really going to use this locomotive for switching duties. Some, many railroads did. So it's a good idea to see if this thing can actually handle it. problem on that signing, and yes, that's the same signing that my S4 stalled on when I did my Bachman S4 review, which should be up by the time this video is up. Now let's try a few other sightings. Ooh, it's a rough switch, but it made it through. And I exactly what it's getting. Oh, the front trip came off. Uh, now, considering how tight that siding is, I guess it's acceptable. Let's try this other switch instead. I don't think I'd ever do a switch with it, but let's see if I can make it in there if I wanted to.
Oh well, that's a minor hesitation, but she still crawls along nicely at a slow speed without much of a problem. At least it didn't cut out completely. Again, this locomotive is not equipped with Keep Alive. It just has a standard 21-pin Luke Sound decoder installed from the factory. I think that's mainly because it has six axles, too. That helps it. Let's go backward now. I didn't mean to couple to the car, and I didn't. If you go a little bit quicker, it doesn't stall at all. It just goes, it looks like. Okay. Well, that is actually quite good. Let me actually pull this back onto the main line now. Yes, despite not having Keep Alive, this locomotive performs very well on the switches, even better than that crappy Bachman S4 I tested not too long ago. Now let's take a look under the hood and see exactly what L Walters has done to the original Proto 2000 chassis to improve it since the days of its predecessor, the Proto 2000 Alco PA. To get in, we need to remove this front coupler. Now you can sort of get away with it if you're careful enough, but I recommend removing it. It's just not worth taking the chance of breaking it. One other quirk I have to note here is that unlike the predecessor of this locomotive model by Proto 2000, there is no block off plate to block the area where the coupler would normally go if you were looking to just make it a streamlined model without the coupler in the front as some railroads did. Anyway, once we undo the screw, we can slide the coupler out. And removing the shell is actually really, really simple. In fact, I would call it traditional. Essentially, you simply grasp both sides of the shell, as you see me doing there, and simply pull them away from the chassis, and the chassis will simply drop out, and you can gently lift the shell off. Under the hood, we find that the standard chassis is in use, although modified slightly from the Proto 2000 days. To start with, the board is now mounted in the center, not the back. If we remember, the Proto 2000 had all of its circuitry in the back. This unit puts it to the center. As we see there, it now has a 21-pin socket, which in this case is populated by the Loke Sound. And again, I believe that's a 4.0 decoder on it. And the speaker, as you see there, is located on the back. The front is where the headlight is mounted. mounted same way again. One thing I will also note is that the crew is missing from this particular model. That's one thing that Walters did not put in. Another thing to note, which we really can't see on the front under this worm gear, is a hecular cut gear. This is to say it's cut crossways. This allows the, allows the gears to mesh much easier with, a, with less sound and much less resistance, making for a smooth running locomotive all around. The motor itself is a similar design to the original Proto 2000 PA with five poles allowing for smooth crawls, and that's as far as I'm going to go into this as I do want it available to run. I don't want it apart on my workbench. Now before I put this locomotive back together, I'd like to point something out. This front board here is where the Mars light and the headlight mount. Now obviously this creates a problem if you're looking to upgrade a locomotive that didn't have a Mars light originally. You're, well, going to need to replace this board, and I'm not sure how easy they are to come by. I've since bought a non-DCC and sound equipped D&H variation of this locomotive from Walters, and I'm not sure if it's actually equipped with the Mars light, so that might be an issue I'm going to run into later on. And now let's talk about that all-important detail, the price. Well, as you can see, the non-DCC and sound-equipped variation of this locomotive, which is DCC Ready, comes comes out at one hundred sixty-nine ninety-eight. Again, this is the direct price from Walters. You might be able to, and most likely will be able to, find a better price at your local hobby shop or an online retailer. So shop around if you're looking to get a bigger, better price. As for the DCC and sound variation, it's going to get you $219.98, as you see here, direct from Walters. Not a bad price if you think about what you get for that, but at the same time, please note that installing a decoder in this engine does not appear to be too challenging. At least when you look at the locomotive I have with its 21-pin slot, I'm not sure if it includes the speaker, but I'm going to find out as I've bought a DCC-ready variant of, the, of one of these engines that I will need to put sound in. And please also note there are two versions of this locomotive with sound in it. One has the Econami, which is inferior, and the other has the, of course, uh, ESU Lock Sound 5.0, I believe that is, which is superior. So definitely make sure you get that one. I'm not sure how hard the Econami is to swap out. It all depends on what kind of sock it is, but I'm assuming it's going to have the very much now famous and very popular 21 pinner, which would make things very easy. And so here's my final verdict on this locomotive. I wasn't expecting much when Walters had announced it was going to basically re-release the Alco PA under the Walters mainline brand. Let's face it, that's the economy brand. And while the locomotive did suffer for it, losing the crew detail inside and some of the handrails and a few of the grab irons, everything else was a plus. 
The motor drive has been updated with the Hecular Cut gears. It's been very well weighted. The electronics have been noticeably updated and easier to work with. So there's a, with now standardized with a 21-pin decoder plug socket. Basically, pretty much every last little detail that needed to be done to make this a thoroughly modern locomotive was done and done very well. And that's before we start to talk about how well this thing does on curves, 18-inch curves and rough sections of track. It just held on beautifully. Admittedly, as I've mentioned, I've upgraded my layout in more recent times, but still, this thing was just incredible in terms of how it held the rails. But in my opinion, what really makes this locomotive stand out is when Walters went with ESU Loke Sound for its sound decoders instead of the Ekonami from Soundtracks. This really updated things, especially with the proper 244 16 cylinder sound effect, has ever been installed in a model of this particular locomotive, so it really makes it pop. So bottom line, I'm very happy with this locomotive. I was very impressed with how it held the rails. I'm impressed with the sound effects. I really don't have much in the way of negatives with the exception of the detailing being deleted, the lack of the crew inside the cab, etc. The only thing kind of working against this engine I can see is that the non-DCC equipped price is kind of high. I think it should be not 169 as it priced, I think it should be at 130 but, well, that was a decision Walters made. I still think the DCC and sound price, however, was very reasonable. The only other nitpick I could possibly find is the fact that a lot of people have complained about the dimensions of the nose being off. Well, we'll just have to see, as Rapido is planning to do with 3D, and it was already done, as I understand, a 3D scan for their model, but who knows when that'll be released with the current situation at hand. Bottom line, if you're looking for an HO scale Alco PA with DCC and sound from the factory, this is your locomotive. Get out there and buy one. Better do it quick, though, as production seems to have largely stopped on these units. It might be ramping up for another production run, but I'm not sure if Walters will be, so my advice is get them while they're hot or even available at this point. And that's going to unfortunately do it for this first part of this particular of this particular Alco PA history and review video. Unfortunately, I did not get the MTH locomotive model I was hoping to get in here for that review. And of course, as I mentioned, the Rapido model is not even anywhere near being released most likely, and will most likely get pushed back further as things develop here. So I decided to just cut it off at this point, especially considering how long this video has gone. Anyway, as always, if you liked this film, thumbs up. If you didn't, thumbs down. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe. And again, as always, keep the metal side down